For Proto-Indo-European, we reconstruct relatively few nonstop consonants, many fewer than in English. One sound that we do have, though, is a s sound. And we can see this in the word for seven. We have Latin septem, Greek hepta, Sanskrit sapta, and English seven. So a s goes unchanged in Latin, Sanskrit, and English, but in Greek it does change to this h sound. And that's generally the case. Greek really, really dislikes this s sound and tries to get rid of many of them, making them become a h or even go away completely. Now, the voiced version of this, z, is a little more complicated. By the time of Proto-Indo-European, we think that there were some of them in the language. But realistically, all of these presumably come from a s that's next to a voiced consonant. So when we have a s next to a voiced consonant, it undergoes assimilation. It tries to become more like the sound that's near it. And it does so by going from voiceless to voiced. So this word, nistos, which has to do with the sit root, which we know from English has an S, becomes nisdos, with a z sound that's treated differently from the s. In fact, Latin, Sanskrit, both get rid of it completely, nidos and nida. We don't have the s sound that we see up here in the seven word. In English, we have nest, where the z sound has gone back to a s, partly because the following consonant is voiceless. We get assimilation back the other way. We have nasals, n, so in that same root meaning nest, we see that Latin, Sanskrit, and English all keep a n. And we have m the labial one. So in this word for mother, the m sound stays the same in Latin, mater, Greek, mater, Sanskrit, mata, and English, mother. So generally, these sounds are unchanged throughout most of the languages, definitely Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, and English in general. So that means that they're not affected by Grimm's Law. Remember, Grimm's Law only applies to stops. Now, I mentioned in a, a few videos ago that we, re we reconstruct sounds called laryngeals for Proto-Indo-European. So laryngeals are three distinct consonant sounds for Proto-Indo-European. But the exact types of sounds that they are, we don't really know. People have various arguments. Uh, they believe that perhaps they're said in different parts of the mouth. They might be what's known as pharyngeal. But in general for these, we don't really know exactly what sounds they were. And that's because in the daughter languages, the descendants of Proto-Indo-European, with very few exceptions, they were gotten rid of entirely or they turned into a vowel. And we'll see an example of that coming up. In short, there's pretty much no effect that laryngeals have on English as far as we're concerned and certainly not for Grimm's Law. But we represent these with an H with a number and a subscript. You may have seen this in some of the previous videos. So here are some examples that we saw in those previous videos. This one, H1, which we call H1 or a first laryngeal, gives us this E in Greek, but it doesn't show up in Latin, Sanskrit, or English. This one, H2 or second laryngeal, comes out as an A sound in Latin and Greek and also English, but in Sanskrit, something else happens. This I is because, because we have a laryngeal, not necessarily the second, but any laryngeal between two consonants. If you look at a bunch of words in Sanskrit, you'll see that that tends to be the pattern. 
For third laryngeal, we see that it doesn't show up in Latin, Sanskrit, or English, but it turns into an O in Greek. So that explains some of these extra vowels at the start of Greek words. In our next video, we'll examine how Grimm's Law can be changed or restated in light of this new evidence about Proto-Indo-European.